<laughs> what are you dressed as? Uh, I'm Killua. Who's that? Hunter Hunter. It's an anime. Mm. Japanese. You can't just be like Freddy or Jason or Mike Myers or something. Yeah. Oh, I just watched an anime. I'm a big anime guy. People know that about me. It's, you a, want... it's a unique costume. There are two types of costumes, right? There's like hair now. the Harley Quinn, which you see a million of, and there's the one that no one knows who thrives off the attention of people like, oh, who are you? And you can go on and just... I'd rather, I'd rather go balls out and look exactly like the part of a well, you mainstream look, costume. You look just like Homelander. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, but like Homelander is... It's not so much the look, it's more the personality. That's why. So it, it was a shot at me, giving me Homelander. Uh, depending on what side of the aisle you're on. <laughs> I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, I'm gonna come. <laughs> just go. It's a sketch phrase. Yeah, no, no, I know. I'm just imagining the animation of just randomly cutting to that. <laughs> the victim's belief in possession is what helped cause it. So, in that same way, that belief in the power of exorcism can make it disappear. You're telling me that I should take my daughter to a witch doctor. Is that it? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Killawa Oliver, joined today by Aaron Ratner, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and Ted Lander, and we are back to review the very iconic, the granddaddy of horror movies. The Exorcist. Play the theme. Do I have to do my review as Howie? Yeah, sure. I don't do a Howie, so I'll do like old school Adam Howie, Sandler. Howie, what, uh, what, what were your thoughts on this? <laughs> <They were> very scary. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So The Exorcist, like I said, it is considered one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Directed by William Friedkin, uh, directed by William Friedkin and based on the book written by... J.K. Rowling. J.K. Scott. F. Scott Fitzgerald, you mean? Eh, William Peter Blatty. Hmm. And like I said, this is one of the most iconic movies of all time. So we figured we'd review it in celebration of spooky season, Halloween, Halloween Day. Um, so I'll just throw this to you guys. Uh, general thoughts on The Exorcist. I absolutely love this movie. But to say... Wow, we we'll bought that quickly, huh? I know. <laughs> it wasn't as scary as I remembered it. I think I want to say because of the time, and maybe I'm just like hypersensitive or desensitized to you like scary movies really now broad daylight on twitter playing with your dog <laughs> no I wasn't, your PSP. I wasn't doing all that i was at night <laughs> i don't know i think with it's the just the time plus with commercials in between different movies hit different I, like i think the shining still holds up with scariness to today but i don't think this movie holds up scary wise to today just because of i guess the effects it wasn't it just looked too fake, honestly. Well, I haven't seen this movie in a while. I, I know I watched it when I was younger, but this was kind of like a first-time viewing for me in, in a lot of ways because I really didn't remember most of the movie. Yeah, we all know the scenes of the head turning around and how the, the girl looks and the, the vomit. vomit and all of those iconic scenes from the movie. The, uh, it's a ex- rough night. Rough couple of nights <laughs> yeah. with this poor girl. <laughs> it, was like, it was like three days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> she saw me last weekend. I went on a mini bender. <laughs> Next day, I was looking like This is like just her. a normal weekend for you and Nash, right? <laughs> um, so, for a lot of the characters, a lot of the setup, I didn't really remember as vividly. And just from that aspect alone, I think this movie is incredible. I think it's it's one of the more iconic, and many consider it a masterpiece of horror. And it's obvious why. And as for the the date, the only like real problem I had with the how dated it was was with audio and shit like that yeah uh, that happens to me a lot for a lot of movies i thought the practical effects and in my mind knowing it was from 1972 right. it didn't bother me one bit and i think it's actually pretty impressive what they were able to accomplish back then you know i heard stories of people like having heart attacks and like throwing up in the theaters when this movie came out how about you oh, it's very very real I don't like it. I want to go home. I want to see if it's going to make me throw up. I mean, that is one of the most grossest movies uh-huh. in the world. <laughs> Yeah, especially like in the 70s, this probably... Nowadays, you see stuff like that. You're really hitting like, all the buttons back in the day with this movie. Yeah. Right, well, that's why I think it's just timeless. And I recently rewatched Nightmare on Elm Street, and I think that's also a timeless premise. 
and you can watch these movies with the 70s and 80s aesthetic, which I do enjoy. Mm. But the scares are just always going to be there for me because the idea of a young girl being possessed by a demon is terrifying. And like you said, audiences, apparently they were throwing up in theaters, having heart attacks. Pretty extreme. But to be in 1973 and to watch this must have been just an unbelievable experience. I was surprised looking back at the critical or award acclaim it received. It won two Oscars. It got nominated for Best Picture. It won the Golden Globe for Best Drama. Yeah, I think it won Adapted Screenplay and Sound. And it's funny, you mentioned that you didn't like some of the audio. I thought the sound in this movie was great. And also... The yeah, special score. effects. That was one of the points in Roger Ebert's uh, review. The special effects make the story so convincing. Mm-hmm. The puppetry, the makeup, and going to the sound design, th- th- those feral growls that would come no. out of her that were trembling throughout the house. It the made desi- me so scared. Yeah. The design the was great, but I was just talking more of the audio coming out of my TV and me listening to people talk <laughs> and all that. Okay. And the subtitles. If, did you guys rent it on Amazon? Yeah, when I did direct. Yeah, part that's too. happening a lot the with sub- subtitles. Subtitles were off. Combining words, and so was the audio calibration with the mouth movements. Right, at a, at a lot of times. So that was a little distracting, but obviously that's not going to take away from the movie at all. But to speak on the fear of this movie, this I, for me, this movie didn't become a horror movie until about two thirds into the movie, and that's what made this movie so great. Is that for the first and second act of this movie, it's it's uh, what's the word? It's a uh, <laughs> the first and second act of this movie is more of a social criticism to society back in the day where you didn't want to believe that your kid was being possessed or there, there was like that wasn't even a thought you just jumped right to medicine and science and you went to all these tests you put a little girl through like four or five surgeries tests in a matter of like two days I don't so you're coming a- <laughs> so you're coming down on the side that possession can actually happen yeah no no I'm saying just in their you're mind you're just frustrated that society no I think in, they did the right thing I know, it's, it's easy for us to say uh I'm just saying what's scary is, like, the torment that the mom went through and the and the daughter went through. Right. You're yeah. feeling their pain, and it's like she has no idea what's going on with her kid. And it's like it's so easy. Like, I'm saying and while I'm watching it, I'm like, just bring it to a priest. <laughs> just try it. Well, yeah, in real life, it's like the complete opposite. But yeah. It's something where it's like the you person don't stuck it. in the psychiatric ward that the audience knows isn't crazy. Right. And no one will believe it. It's the same aspect when you know that in this horror movie, yeah, it's completely plausible for someone to be possessed and they go to science and doctors. It's like, what are you doing, idiot? Dude, that test they ran through Get with the, the blood shooting out of that, that fucking spigot thing? Are you kidding me? That, that looks so bad. Well, bad as in, like, it looked horrifying. It's called a cerebral angiography. Mm. Are you kidding? And How old is yeah, this girl? No, that 12? is the scariest part of the movie. And to go to, you know, one of the questions, there are a lot of questions asked in this movie, but one that's never answered is, why is this young girl possessed? And like you said, seeing is believing. For this characters, it's not. For us, it is, because we're getting the full frontal assault, the obscenities, and the horror moments in this movie. But for me, it's a premise. Like you said, they're going through all of these things to figure out what's wrong with this girl. It relates to the way that the universe just doesn't give a fuck. You can be hit with a terminal diagnosis. You could be hit with a car accident. You see the relationship between the mom and the daughter. It's very sweet yeah. and pleasant. And this thing comes out of nowhere. It's like your child being diagnosed with a a terminal cancer or something like that. And like you said, what she goes through in this movie. Did they uh, answer a question? Like, was there a re- I, I may have, maybe I missed it, but why did she get possessed with the demon that the priest on, on Well, they talk about the this in a, in a cut, in an edited scene that's not in the actual movie when Karis asks Marin, why this girl? Why did he choose this girl? And he says, it's the devil trying to show humanity that God can never love us. It's to show us as, as animalistic, as ugly. They'll go to anybody. Right, yeah, and I think that the main theme that I grab from this movie is just grappling with death, and that's a question that we cannot answer, and Everyone we see the, that throughout this movie, the, the question's d- not being... I think the best line of the movie is when she says to Karis, she's seen every psychiatrist in the world, they send me to you, you're going to send me back to them? Yeah. It's it's never-ending. Everyone the, devil, this- the devil just might not be a fan of her work, not a fan of her as an actress, just... She was cast in Supergirl, he's like, not my Supergirl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the main theme, I feel like in this movie, was despair. Like you said, everyone in this movie was dealing with something. And right, what- and, and you guys talked about the setup in this movie. The character of Karis is really what grounds this movie because that that's a character I think everyone can experience, everyone can relate to what that character is going through. Well, yeah, he's an interesting character too. Being a priest and a psychiatrist, there's kind of those two conflicting ideologies it's right kind of there. kind contradictory. Yeah, and he's saying that he's losing his faith in all this, and obviously he has 
his mother and that kind of weighs on him as well and just seeing from where he gets to the point in the beginning to to the end where he sacrifices himself and I guess embracing that priesthood that holiness and taking on the demon for himself to take uh, to save this young girl who we just met very recently. Right, and you you wonder if it's a, sort of a personal redemption for him mm-hmm. because he believes his quest to become a psychiatrist, he left his mom alone and now she is dead. And it's also, it goes to show that faith isn't mutually exclusive. In order to believe in God, you also have to believe in the devil, and he isn't believing in either. And in the end, when he does sacrifice himself, he grabs the girl and says, take me, take me. So I don't know if this character is ultimately suicidal, but I think he's willing to give his life in order to get that personal redemption and restore his own faith. Well, it's also just very interesting looking at the, I guess, the ideologies of church and religion going from when they say, what, 1600s was the last exorcism up until now, where back then, and even now, if you believe in everything, something like this is plausible, if you believe in the devil and God going against each other. But just where we advance as a society, that's kind of left on the back burner, where you have things like science and uh, psychiatry and uh, doctors to tell you differently. But right, and this the, is kind of like a blast from the past, where you could see a a man of God and who who knows the history of these things to be like, oh, this is actually plausible in this sense, like, right? Like and a Marin character. The the writer wanted to shed a positive light on Catholicism with this movie, so the sacrifice at the end, you can say, you can believe in whatever you want, whether if it's God, positivity, light, that there is something to hold on to in order to beat back the despair and sometimes the torment that is life unfortunately yeah watching him go from a non-believer through that whole scene in regan's room was well that's when the horror too, really ramps yeah. up right? oh yeah that's that, just a fucking battle yeah they, they went from a, like a zero to a hundred and in like <laughs> five minutes he tried so hard he's like it's like well you know she didn't speak a different language right yeah <laughs> that was just tap water it wasn't real holy water fucking zombie dude yeah, she's speaking are English. you not watching this guy <laughs> you see this? Like well, that bed starts floating. It's like, well, her mom is an actress and yeah. has access to <laughs> Hollywood magic. Yeah, that's probably a my being punked fact. when she tells a doctor. I-, I was on the bed. The bed was shaking. <laughs> I know, and I-, I think Max von Sydow was just a brilliant stroke of casting. Because whereas Karras is having all this doubt, this man is just buried in his conviction. Oh, and when he's, he walks in that no room him. and he says, "Silence!" Being worthless, cocksucker. Be silent. Oh. Oh. When he starts spitting. God, the Holy Spirit commands you. The mystery of the cross commands you. The blood of the martyrs commands you. Dude, I can listen to that man talk about the finer points of exorcism. Why the makeup, though? I don't, I don't mind the makeup. It's funny, because I had just been watching, when I first watched this... In mean, like, 72, he's still an older man, so to speak. Right. I guess the experience, he wanted, he wanted to convey a more grizzled guy who they said he did an exorcism in Africa that took months and almost killed him. So Heart problems, too, though. He's, he's taking heart pills. He was right, just, yeah, so, no, he was just in Iraq. It's been physically draining on him. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, his character is someone who is trying to explore and discover the unknown, discover those answers. So I think there, there are so many different interpretations for that character. You can see him as a scientist, a philosopher, or... As a religious man, I do love when Karis tries to fill him in on the case of the exorcism, yeah. and he's like, "Why would you do that? This is <laughs> just, just like, you know. Th- I, I'm, I'm. This is the devil. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. I'm here to take care of this." <laughs> I wish the prequels were like not awful. They made like, oh uh, yeah, they made like five other exorcisms. Oh right, yeah. No, I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> Emily Rose one is pretty good though. That's I what I. Like that one. That's what I hate. Well, I, I, never, I didn't see it either, but, but I just see like the Rotten Tomato score, and it's like kind of like with the Hannibal thing. It's like. There could have been a great story to go back into this, or just don't make it. But they did make it, and it's awful, so I don't want to watch it. But with that character there, what they set up in this movie, there's like, yeah, there's probably tons of movies going around this guy, just going around the country. Why was he in Iraq? What did he find? How did he know what he found? Like, it sh- visibly shaped him so much. There is a story there, and they kind of just went Hollywood fashion. It's like, let's make five more of these bad boys. Well, that's tradition. <laughs> if you have a classic horror movie, the next five have to be awful. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then you have to get the reboot in like, 30, 40 years that comes out and is good again. Dude, I'll take a good reboot of The Exorcist. Well, I, I think that's book. why it's it's a premise that works for this movie, and if you do expand upon it, you have to continue to be smart and clever, and that's not easy to do, as evident by these prequels. I'll tell you what, though. This movie, there wasn't a scene wasted or dialogue. I, I'm watching this entire movie just like in a, like amazement. Well, it moved along pretty well. I mean, yeah. there are some gaps in time there, obviously, where he sees his mother, and then she's in a hospital, and then she's dead. There's not a lot of in-between, so it moves along pretty quickly without leaving enough out, because I feel like as where some movies might try to connect 
a couple scenes with something maybe useless. They kind of just got right to the points they needed to hit and moved it along into the more, I guess, pressing issues of the film. You know, reading up on the behind the scenes of this movie, it's funny to think that there was so much trepidation about the casting of who was going to play Reagan because the studio didn't feel that a 12-year-old actress could carry a story that was so dark and disturbing. But I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Linda Blair in this movie is one of the greatest performances ever. Oh, she killed it. She's I, great. You I know watched... the, like, some of the things she says that you wouldn't expect, like normal 12-year-old won't say, some, like the thing with the cross, it's a very grotesque movie especially for back then it's very disturbing at times and the things that she is saying to her mother it's yeah. never not going to be <laughs> yeah. obscene yeah when i'm what i watched a couple of behind the scenes a lot of the actors said that she was amazing and it was insane watching her go from this like bubbly beautiful 12 year old girl to what they put her through through makeup and how she performed as the demon that she did such a great job it's the innocence of a child that's always so disturbing Stu made this point you just look at these these children when children have that evilness in their eyes and they're kids right you just kick them in the stomach and you would think that's that <laughs> but she's got the super strength she, she's throwing shit around the room those scenes were all so well, it's, icky I think it took Damien a little too long to just start beating the shit out of her once she said your mother sucks cock and hell I'm throwing fucking hands yeah at this point <laughs> <laughs> well he kept he kept losing his focus and Marin kept having to bring him in yeah, and bring him yeah in. Marin kept telling this guy it's like everything she's saying is false like stop falling into it right <laughs> and, and it just goes to show how hard that temptation is it's hard to resist the temptation of, of vengeance and a lot of the technical aspects I think uh, really stand out do any stand out for you guys in particular I think the most evident when it comes to just the setting of the room itself it was always like you're going to a different place every time they entered yeah. and they use it with lighting especially at the end with the lighting and the flashes i think they did a good job of Their making breath. that place kind of like well they built the room in a freezer did so, they really yeah that's so sick. every time they went in there the crew would have to dress like they were in fucking antarctica that's sick so i, th I think just having that contrast of the rest of the house and that room really s just every time you go in there you're cold too inside you're in <laughs> you're in hell man <laughs> and i always love in like older movies too when you see them, them do these things obviously without cgi it's like how'd they make the bed go up and down how'd they make her float think of all like the work that goes into that you have to be more creative with your effects and that's always an appreciation i have with older films right. the head how did you know there's a way to do it i couldn't think of it with her head turning around isn't she dead I mean, it's a demon. No, she's a demon. She's being. She's got the superpowers. You don't have superpowers, guy. You're, her room's you're, Antarctica. She's, and she's just her chilling neck. in there. This is like, uh, if you're the devil, get rid of the straps. Hold your horses here, okay? <laughs> okay I'm, I'm gonna not, build to that. Yeah, I'm not arrogant. I'm <laughs> the devil, but yeah, well, I gotta build to that guy. Come on. <laughs> I'll hit you with the kame kamaha when you bring in the big gun. For now, you know, we're gonna shake some beds, open some drawers. <laughs> yeah, shake some beds, open some drawers. When they play that, when they play that tape back, they're like, no, not Marin. They get shook. It's like, yeah. oh, they don't want to bring the big guy in. Yeah. <laughs> he was scared, man. He really was. Captain Howdy. Yeah, and I just want to shout out uh, Mercedes McCambridge, who actually provided the voice of Reagan when she turned in to the demon. In time. No, no. In time. You're obviously dick, too, don't you agree? Credit to Luna Blair to kind of, you know, lip sync those. You know, people, it's pretty hard to do that in a convincing manner, where... You would think you hear a different voice and the, the mouth has to be perfect or it just loses all that kind of uh, magic to it. I was so happy that she didn't know what happened to her. She kisses him too, the priest, so it kind of like assures him that it's gone. Right, yeah, and her fear throughout the movie when the demon finally does leave her and she's just trembling mm -hmm. in the corner. It's just when, when you're hit with the extremities of human suffering as a child, it's just so much different from when you're an adult. Because as, as an adult, you could say, okay, you can come to terms with your mortality. That's me I want to remember. Harder me up a little. No, seriously. Oh, yeah, yeah I want I those that. battle scars. That's, yeah. a, that's a sequel. She comes back and she's like, I'm going to make sure this never happens yeah. again to any she other She becomes the new, uh, the new head. The well, new Marin. Yeah. I just want to say Jason Miller is the actor who played Karis, and he also won the Pulitzer Prize and the Tony for drama for his play that championship season. So, hell of a 1973. Same year. Nominated for Best wow. Supporting Actor and wins a Pulitzer and a Tony. Hmm. I think I can match that by the time it's all said and done. You know, this movie had well, a lot When of... did you edit that Cersei video essay? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, you're 20, you had a hell of a 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew. I, I was doing some research on this movie. I didn't know how much... Well, it had a lot of problems, like post-production and getting out into theaters. They were going to go oh, wide yeah, theaters. and all over the yeah, place. Yeah, but they went limited. People wanted to give it the X rating. Yeah. And they went to R so they can play it for a wide audience. And they didn't go with the wide audience because of how much... How bad that Warner Brothers didn't want to put it out but it was getting so much love from people 
that they had to go to Watchbird. Oh, I could picture just the panic. Even today, if this came out, which is the panic That's back the then, thing. especially like this, oh my god, dude, like just super religious people. Like this is the devil's movie, <laughs> and oof. That's like just, you said. That They're probably fine. just made the kids of that day more eager to see it and sneak out and get a ticket. Right. And coming out in the seventies, it's a time when people are becoming more disillusioned with their faith and leaving behind religion. I guess, in favor of more rational thinking, science. And we're seeing that in today's society as well. And like I said, I think the author is making a point here that there's always room for faith. They put it belief. in the movie with Harris. He was he was, le- he was thinking about leaving the faith. Right. And he got steered back into it. But yeah, no, your point about even if this movie came out today, that's the thing. That there are things in this movie, 1973, mm. when you think about censorship, for them to just drop this in the yeah. middle of the two Godfathers, what a couple of years. Yeah, but an amazing movie overall, and like we said, I think we all loved it. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Are you going trick-or-treating this year? <laughs> I'm 27. No? <laughs> so that's enough. You just say no. You Do you still to... go trick-or-treating? Do you like borrow the I go youngest family niece. member you can find? And... I go with my yep. niece, yes. Of course <laughs> Is you that bad? You, know, you pull the Joe Biden tax plan where 40% of this is going to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You pay rent here? Well, no, you know, it's a family thing. We go out as a family to... My two nieces, my dog. I can't imagine the <laughs> yeah, two. You just bags. got your dog a month ago, so I'm acting like bringing the dog is a tradition. <laughs> it's gonna be. He's Batman this year. What are you, Robin? I wanted to be Batman, and I was gonna have him be Robin, but no one is like, no, Robin's a girl. <laughs> I'm like, oh god, <laughs> just give him the Batman. Well, would you look at that? It's finally over. Hey guys, Bo Oliver here for one final send off. Now, before I beg you guys to like and share this video, I'd like to thank our very special Patreon pledgers. We are very proud of the community we've been able to build here at NerdTube, and it would not have been possible without our Patreon supporters. You guys are the true MVPs of this channel. Everything I've said, you keep the fridge full, you keep the lights on. There aren't enough words to thank you guys, but we'll do it anyway. Thank you. And we have a few videos coming up that have been suggested to us by Patreon pledgers. My Hero Academia, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Full Metal Alchemist will be reviewed by Marissa, and yours truly, and Castlevania, which will be reviewed by Marissa and Aaron. And if you'd like to consider donating to our Patreon page, you can visit patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out some of the rewards we offer to our listeners. And really, we'd like to thank everyone who takes the time out of their day to watch our videos. Patreon pledger or not, your support is what keeps us motivated to keep giving the world our opinions on movies and TV shows and video games and pop culture, even though no one asked for it. We're still here, we're still yapping, and we hope you continue to join us. I'm Bo Oliver and I support this message.